Muy buenos días, amables amigos y hermanos presentes. Good morning, kind friends and brethren present, and radio listeners. It is a great blessing and privilege to be with you on this occasion, to share some moments of fellowship around the divine program pertaining to this end time, and thus, have a conversation with you about the whole divine program that God has promised to carry out at this end time according to the book of Revelation and other prophecies of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Therefore, our subject will be the battle of the seventh seal in the great mystery of the seventh seal. For this reason, I want to read in the book of Revelation and also in the book or letter of St. Paul, the Apostle, to the Corinthians in his first letter, chapter 15, verses 42 to 58. First, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses, let's read verses 49 to 56, where it says, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. He is going to speak about a mystery of the kingdom of God. He says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 to 5 says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. In these two passages, we find in Revelation the seventh seal being opened in heaven, which is the second coming of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 49 to 58, we find the mystery of the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the transformation of us who are alive, where St. Paul tells us that the last trumpet will sound 
and then will come the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of us who are alive, where we will obtain a total victory because we will obtain physical immortality as well. You may be seated if you are so kind. Kind friends and brethren present, our subject is the battle of the seventh seal in the great mystery of the seventh seal. The mystery of the seventh seal is the greatest mystery in the heavens and on earth, of which Christ said, referring to this mystery of the second coming of Christ, that neither in heaven nor on earth no man knew when the day and the hour would be. And he said, not even the angels know, nor does the Son know when it will be. In other words, even Jesus Christ himself, humanly, did not know when the coming of the Son of Man at the last day would be, because God had not yet made Jesus aware of the mystery of the second coming in terms of when the day and hour of the second coming of Christ would be. He did not know in which century the second coming would be, but he knew that the coming of the Son of Man would be fulfilled at the end time. And he prophesied of the coming of the Son of Man at the end time. And we find some prophecies of Jesus, the great prophet of Nazareth, in St. Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 to 28, where it says, let's see here, let's start with verse 24, so that you get a clearer picture, it says, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then, in St. Matthew, chapter 17, verse 1 and on, it says, it says, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, then appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lift up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. It was a vision that Christ gave his disciples there. And his disciples asked him, 
Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. In this passage of St. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 to 13, we have the vision of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels coming in the kingdom of his Father. Remember that this is a vision which contains all the elements that will be manifested in the coming of the Son of Man with his angels in his Father's kingdom. Everything is shown there in that vision. Everything is there on a small scale to be fulfilled at the last day. And now, we have the promise that the coming of the kingdom of God with the Son of Man coming with his angels will be fulfilled at the last day, which is the seventh millennium, because one day before the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, says Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and Psalm 90, verse 4, which is a psalm of the prophet Moses. One day before God is a thousand years to human beings. And when Jesus spoke of the last day, he is referring to the last millennium, where Christ will carry out the resurrection of the dead in Christ. The promise is in St. John chapter 6, verses 39 to 40, where it says, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That is a promise of Christ to be fulfilled at the last day. Also, in St. John, chapter 11, verse 21 and on, it says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. This was what Jesus had taught in chapter 6 of St. John, that in the resurrection he would raise up all the saints, believers in him, and that would be at the last day. And Martha knew Jesus' teaching about the resurrection of the saints and Christ to be raised, when? At the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She, Martha, said unto him, Yea, Lord, she believed what Jesus told her. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now notice the divine revelation that Martha had regarding Jesus of Nazareth. She knew that he was the Son of God. She, Martha, knew that her brother Lazarus would rise because he was a believer in our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And she knew that the resurrection of all the believers in Christ would be at the last day because Christ had made the promise for all the believers saying, and I will raise him up at the last day. But in this case of Lazarus, 
Christ is making Lazarus a type and figure of all his believers who will be raised at the last day if their physical bodies have died. And if their physical bodies have not died, if they are alive and they see the coming of the Son of Man with his angels and then they see the dead in Christ raised, those people will be changed. Their bodies will be changed in their atoms. And then they will have an eternal body, a new body like the body of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, just as the saints who will rise will have an eternal body. But Christ is going to use as a type and figure, as a symbol of the dead in Christ who will rise at the last day. He is going to use Lazarus as an example to show that it's Christ who will raise his believers who have died, just as he is going to raise Lazarus as an example that he has that power to carry out that resurrection at the last day. And now he uses Lazarus as an example who Jesus said had slept, but according to the way human beings speak, they say, he has died. But as for God's sons and daughters, they say, he has gone to sleep. For the children of God do not die because they have eternal life. Only the physical body sleeps or dies. But at the last day, the dead in Christ will rise in eternal bodies. Just sleeping until that moment comes the physical part of the person is sleeping, but he will awaken in an eternal body. He will awaken to this reality that we live here on earth because they will come from the sixth dimension, from the dimension where they are currently in their theophanic bodies. They will come, they will return, they will rise in an eternal body that Christ will give them, and then they will be with us here on earth again. Everyone from the different stages or ages of the church of Jesus Christ, they will be with us at this end time, and we who are alive will be changed. Now, when we say, we who are alive will be changed and the dead in Christ will be raised, that is referring to the people who have believed in Christ as their Savior, washed away their sins in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and received the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and therefore they have obtained a new birth. They have been born again. They have been born into the kingdom of God. When Christ was speaking, of the new birth, which places the person in the kingdom of God, he said to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus visited him by night, St. John chapter 3, verse 1 and on, says the following, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he cannot understand it. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Neither Nicodemus nor any human being can marvel that it is necessary to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven 
because everyone needs to believe in Christ as his Savior. Wash away his sins in the blood of Christ and receive his Holy Spirit. And that is how the new birth is brought forth in the person. And that is how he is born into the mystical body of Christ into the church of Jesus Christ. That is how he is born into the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven and becomes a part of that mystical body of believers called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that person dies in terms of a physical body, it is no problem because that person already obtained eternal life when he believed in Christ. That person received eternal life and therefore he's already an immortal person. But his physical body is mortal and that is why his physical body dies. But the person continues to live in soul and spirit because he has a theophanic spirit of the sixth dimension, a theophanic body of the sixth dimension, which is similar to this body that we have here on earth, but it is a body from another dimension, from the sixth dimension. And the person, if his physical body dies, he goes on to live in that theophanic body. He goes on to live in paradise until the time comes for the resurrection of the dead in Christ when that person or those people will come back and they will take up a new body, an eternal body, not the same body they had when they lived here on earth because the body we have obtained by being born through our earthly parents is a mortal, corruptible, and temporary body. That is why an eternal body is required to live eternally. For flesh and blood cannot inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God either. We will be in the glorious millennial kingdom of Christ, reigning with him as kings and priests when we are in the new body. But in this mortal body, we have to be living on this earth like the rest of the human beings and have an earthly job like the rest of the human beings. The job that the person chooses or that the person can obtain here on earth according to his social and economic status. We can see that it is not very important what job we have here on earth as long as it is honest work and we can be faithful to Christ even in our work. Everyone should have a job, but it should be an honorable job, a job that abides by the laws of the country where they live. They should not get involved in questionable businesses that are against the law in their country. Now, in terms of the earthly life, we live here on this earth while we are in this mortal, corruptible, and temporary body. But when we have the new body, then we will be in the position and function of kings and priests with Christ in the glorious millennial kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And before that glorious millennial kingdom comes, which will be after the great tribulation, when the divine judgments will be poured upon the earth, before that, we obtain that glorious eternal body even before the great tribulation. And we will be here on earth in that body for 30 to 40 days. And then we will go to the house of our Heavenly Father to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. In other words, the rapture or catching away of God's elect of the church of Jesus Christ 
will be in eternal bodies. No one can be caught away and taken to the marriage of the Lamb while he is in the mortal, corruptible, and temporary body. He needs a new body. He needs to be clothed in the garment of the new body to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will receive that new body while we're here on earth when we see the dead in Christ raised in eternal bodies. Now, before the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the transformation of us who are alive takes place, St. Paul the Apostle says that the trumpet will sound the last trump. And now, it is important to know what the last trumpet is, which will be sounding at the last day, at the time when the dead in Christ will be raised and we who are alive will be changed. In order to understand what the last trumpet is, we have to go to the scriptures. And let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, where St. John the Apostle says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Where was John? What time was John transported to? The Lord's day. The Lord's day is the seventh millennium. That is the last day. That is the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. What did he hear? A great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Who is the Alpha and Omega? Who is the first and the last? Our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, John the Apostle, being transported in the Spirit, in other words, in his Euphanic body, to the Lord's day, meaning to the seventh millennium, heard a great voice as of a trumpet speaking, speaking to him, and it said to him, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It is the voice of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ speaking on the Lord's day and identifying himself as the same one who was in a body of flesh 2,000 years ago. And now, at the last day, he will be on earth again, in the midst of his church, speaking to his church with that great voice of trumpet. And now, we find him again in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, we have the invitation of Christ speaking with that voice of trumpet, it is the voice of Christ speaking with that voice of trumpet at the last day and inviting us to go up where he is. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Christ has been in his church from age to age, manifested through the messenger of each age with Christ and Holy Spirit, anointing the messenger of each age and speaking through the messenger of each age during these seven stages or ages of the gentle church. In the first age of the church of Jesus Christ, among the Gentiles, Christ in Holy Spirit was manifested in St. Paul. St. Paul said, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It was Christ and St. Paul speaking in that first stage or age of the gentle church, which was fulfilled in Asia Minor. 
It was the same one who appeared to Moses in that pillar of fire. Now he had appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus in that same light or pillar of fire, which is a light brighter than the light of the sun. And he said to Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And say, Paul, knowing that it was the voice of the same one who had spoken to Moses back then on Mount Sinai, says to him, Lord, who are you? Because he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as he had said to Moses. And now Saul wants to know who he is because he is telling him that he is persecuting him. And the Christians were the ones who Saul was persecuting, the believers in Jesus Christ, because Saul was very zealous of his religion and he was even willing to kill anyone to defend his religion. Just as there are many people who go to the extremes, go as far as fanatism, and they are even willing to kill anyone else. And then they find themselves in the position of criminals before the presence of God. They find themselves in the position in which Cain found himself when he killed his brother Abel. And then they find that their hands are stained with blood, with the blood of their brethren. And then they will have to give an account to God because their brethren's blood cries out before the presence of God. And now, notice how people who go to religious extremes make grave mistakes for which they will later have to give an account to God. Now notice how in the times of Jesus and even of the Old Testament prophets, when God would send a prophet, most of the time they were persecuted and they were even killed. We find that with Moses, the very people he brought out of Egypt tried to kill the prophet Moses ten times. Not all people, but people who rose up against Moses and wanted to be leaders too and got the people to rise against the prophet Moses. And they said that it was better to go back to Egypt than to continue in that journey to the promised land through the wilderness where there were so many difficulties. In the Christian journey, to immortality, which Christ has promised, we have a road full of many difficulties, of many trials along the way. But notice, all those trials and those difficult situations are because we are still in these mortal bodies. And since all things work together for good, we find that when things are good, people thank God and say, I serve God because He blesses me. He prospers me materially and gives me so many things that I serve God. But now, what if instead of having all those material blessings, they receive trials like Job? Job was a rich man. And the devil said of Job, he said to God, Job serves you because you have him doing well. You have blessed him greatly. And anyone in that situation serves you. Let me take away all his goods, all his substance, 
and you will see that he will stop serving you. God has confidence in his children. God knows that a son or daughter of God serves God whether or not they have earthly comforts. They serve God whether they have earthly goods or they don't have earthly goods. A son or daughter of God serves God in good times and also in bad times. And the devil said, that was not the case. And God allowed him to take away all his goods or substance. The devil said, let me take away all his substance and you will see that he will deny you. He replied to him, you can take away all his substance, but do not touch his soul. He took away all his substance, and he even took away his children. But what Job said when they gave him the news that he had lost all his substance and that he had also lost his children, Job said, God gave and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the name of God. A son or daughter of God may have many financial resources and lose them suddenly and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will continue serving my Lord Jesus Christ because a child of God serves God whether he is rich or whether he is poor. There is no difference when it comes to serving God. And members of their family may die whether it be their parents or one of their children or all of their children and the son of god or daughter of god says god gave god has taken away and he took them away from me but he took them to a better place he took them to paradise they will not have to be suffering here in the struggles of this earthly life anymore so they're safe there and i will see them again in the resurrection Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they continue moving forward in their Christian life. They do not say, Lord, why did you take them away from me? And if you gave me these children, why did they die this way? They do not argue with God. Lord, you gave me these children and now you're taking them and they are better off there with you. You're taking them to paradise to spend a vacation there until the resurrection takes place. And you will send them back to me again in a new body where they will not have problems in an immortal body. But I will continue moving forward. I'll be waiting for them when they return and I will also have an eternal body. See? So there is no problem. God gave and God has taken away. Now, we can see that all things work together for good. St. Paul the Apostle says, they work together for good for God's elect. Where is that written? In Romans chapter 8, St. Paul the Apostle says, who went through major experiences, who lost his position in the Sanhedrin Council, who lost his position in the Hebrew religion under the law, and all things worked for good. He became a more important person than he was there in the Hebrew religion, there in the Sanhedrin Council. He became the great apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles for the first age of the Gentile Church. He became the angel messenger of the first age of the Gentile Church. And he will have a very important position in the glorious millennial kingdom. And now the high priest in the time of St. Paul, notice, was the most important person among the Hebrew people. And he did not lose that position among the Hebrew people, but he has nothing in the glorious millennial kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. So notice, Paul lost everything, but he gained the most important position 
that any man could gain in those days among the Gentiles in the first age of the Gentile church. The highest position was being the angel messenger of that first age. Just as St. Peter was a messenger to the group of Hebrews there in the land of Israel who believed the message of Jesus Christ, he was a top leader of the Hebrew group of believers in Jesus Christ back then. Although the pillars of the Hebrew church or of the church among the Hebrews, as it is seen in the book of Acts, were Jacob or James and also John. But now we can see that among the Gentiles, St. Paul obtained the highest position that a human being could obtain before the presence of God. That is also how it has also been for each angel messenger that God has sent in each age of the seven gentle church ages as well as the age of the cornerstone. And now, St. Paul says in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 28 and on, he says, chapter 8, verse 14 to 18 says, chapter 8, verses 14 to 18 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Notice, God left a portion of sufferings, of afflictions for God's elect, the members of the mystical body of Christ. That is why it says, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory which shall be revealed in us when we have the new body. Notice, it's so great that we cannot compare the sufferings we have here on earth in this mortal body. We cannot compare them with the glory that will be revealed in us when we have the new body. We will be kings and priests in the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ, and there is no position higher than that in the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ, in that glorious millennial kingdom. And we will be there with him. No money in the world could buy you that blessing, that position. It has been given by grace to all the sons and daughters of God who have believed in Christ as their Savior and washed away their sins in the blood of Christ and received His Holy Spirit and therefore have been born again and obtained a new body, a theophanic body of the sixth dimension. And at the last day, they will also obtain a physical and eternal body in which we will live for all eternity. Now it goes on to say, in this same chapter, chapter 8, verse 28 and on. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now notice, we have been predestinated to be in the image and likeness 
of our Lord Jesus Christ to thus have a theophanic body of the sixth dimension, a theophanic spirit like the spirit of Christ, and also to have a glorified body like the body of Jesus Christ, and to all be in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, and so that he may be in us and with us and among us as our elder brother. St. Paul says that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He is our elder brother. That is why he obtained his theophanic body before us. And he obtained his physical and eternal body before us. Our souls come from God. They are eternal. We were with God always, eternally. Those souls are God's sons and daughters. They are eternal souls. The human being is soul, spirit, and body. The most important thing about a person is his soul. That is why Jesus says, For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Why? Because what his soul is, is what the person truly is. The physical body is just a house, in other words, an earthly garment. And the spirit that a person receives when he is born is another body from another dimension. In other words, the person has two bodies. He has an inner body and an outer body. The inner body is called the inward man, and the outer body is called outward man. And the person's soul is in that inner body. The person's soul comes from God. If he is a son of God or a daughter of God, Christ said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be cut down, will be rooted up and cast into the fire. And now, Notice how all these souls that come from God have the promise of redemption. Christ came for them in his first coming as the Lamb of God to die on Calvary's cross and shed his blood for us and cleanse us from all sin with his blood, so that we may be justified before God as if we had never sinned before, and thus be restored to eternal life. That is why he gives us a theophanic spirit of the sixth dimension, that is, the new inward man. And then, at the last day, in the seventh millennium, he will give us a new outer body, which will be the glorified body, and it will be eternal. We will live in it for all eternity. We will live there in that physical and eternal and glorified body with our inner body, in other words, with our inner spirit, the spirit which is a body of the sixth dimension, which we receive when we have believed in Christ as our Savior, and we have washed away our sins in the blood of Christ. And there, in that theophanic body, inside of the physical body, that is where our soul will be living. For we are living souls of God, living on this earth in mortal bodies. But soon we will be in an immortal body, according to the promise of Christ. Now, while we are living in this mortal body, we occupy our position in the kingdom of God, in the program of God. We have come to earth to occupy our position 
to take our position in the program of God and thus to be sealed in the kingdom of God by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, until the day of redemption. In other words, until the day when our physical body will obtain the redemption. In other words, obtain the transformation if we're alive and if our physical body died, well, the person will be raised in a new body, in an eternal body. And to obtain that eternal body in which we will have immortality is to obtain the redemption of the body. And we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, until the day when Christ will give us who are alive the new body and by raising the dead in Christ in the new body, he will also give them the new body. And thus, physically, we will all be redeemed and we will be with God, with Christ, for all eternity. And thus, physically, our body will also be a body that is reconciled to God. Now, while we are in this physical, mortal, corruptible, and temporary body, we go through various difficulties, various trials on earth. We go through various sufferings, and this is us suffering with Christ so that we may reign with Christ during the Millennial Kingdom. If we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. Now, why? Do we suffer? Why do we go through various difficulties? That is like what happened to the Hebrew people who were delivered by God through the prophet Moses and to reach the promised land, the land of Israel. They had to go through a period of 40 years across the wilderness. And to go across that wilderness from Egypt to the land of Israel, it took a matter of days, less than a year. But notice, they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness for a divine purpose. What was that divine purpose? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Verse 1 and on, it says, the reason why. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. In other words, so that what was in the hearts of the people would come out and they would show whether they were going to serve God all the days of their lives, no matter if things were good or if things were difficult. Because when there is abundance, people are very happy because God has blessed them. But when there is scarcity, people complain to God, some people. That is what happened with the Hebrew people. When they did not have food, they complained and rose up against Moses and God and Aaron. And ten times they nearly stoned Moses, their dispensational prophet messenger. And now, Let's see everything. It says here, it says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, 
doth man live. In other words, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, out of the mouth of God. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither thy foot swell these forty years. In other words, as we would say nowadays, those who walked for 40 years through the wilderness didn't even get a callus on their little toe. God even took care of the Hebrew people's feet. But when they rebelled against God, then the divine judgment will fall upon those people. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he had given thee. Notice how here God speaks to the Hebrew people as a father speaks to his child, and he shows him that he will be his heir, but that he must be well behaved all the days of his lives as he goes through that childhood stage and youth stage, the stage of their youth. The stage of the youth of the Hebrew people as a nation was in the wilderness where God was educating the Hebrew nation during that childhood stage of the Hebrew people of Israel. For God says in his word, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, in other words, when he's an adult, he will not depart from it. And notice how God was training his people of Israel, his son Israel, or Jacob, training him up to then adopt him as the only nation of which God says he is their God. The only nation on earth that has the birthright as a nation and therefore has the promise to be adopted as the chief nation of all the nations, as a nation where the throne of the Messiah will be, the throne of the king of the whole earth, who will be the king of Israel, and the son of David, and son of man, will be sitting on the throne of David. In other words, the throne of the king of the whole earth will be the throne of David, where the Messiah promised to the Hebrew people will sit. And Jerusalem will be the capital of the world, and the territory of Israel will be the federal district. Jerusalem, notice, is the city of peace. Although it has not had peace for thousands of years due to the wars, due to the conflicts, there are in that territory. But during the Millennial Kingdom, the name Jerusalem will be honored with peace in Jerusalem and in all the territory of Israel. That will be in the glorious Millennial Kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how its name, Jerusalem, will be honored. And there will be peace. And peace will go forth from Jerusalem into all the world. And the teaching will go forth from Jerusalem. The religious teaching 
and the financial teaching and the teaching of all the other branches of society's daily life. All teaching for mankind to be filled with knowledge will come from Jerusalem, from the capital, just as what comes forth from the capital of every nation, all teaching comes forth. All the laws and teachings for the nation, for every nation. Likewise, all teaching and laws and statutes will go forth into all the world in the religious field as well as in the social field, in all other fields, in the political field and in all the other fields of the human race during the millennial kingdom. In other words, where will the Department of Education be? In Jerusalem. Where will the Department of Justice be? In Jerusalem. Where will the Department of Commerce be? In Jerusalem. Where will the religious department or the Department of Religion be? In Jerusalem. And where will the king of the whole earth be? In Jerusalem. And where will the high priest after the order of Melchizedek be? Also in Jerusalem. Who is Christ? Melchizedek, the king of kings and lord of lords. The Melchizedek, who is king of peace and king of Jerusalem, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God of the temple, which is in heaven, will be on earth in Jerusalem, on the throne of David. Now we can see the great blessing of the Hebrew people to be manifested, to be fulfilled at the last day. In other words, on the Lord's day, which is the seventh millennium. The earthly Israel has a great blessing from God. The blessing of being the only nation. Remember this well. The only nation that has the birthright before God to be the chief nation with a double portion and to be the nation where we will find the king, not only of the Hebrew people, but of every human being who will live on this earth during the millennial kingdom. The king of the whole earth will be there, who is also the king of the whole universe, because he is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is king God, king Theophany, and King Jesus. And now, we find that the king of the seventh dimension, who is God, then the king of the sixth dimension, which is the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, which is God himself in his theophanic body, will be on earth in human flesh, sitting on the throne of David, and he will be king here in this earthly dimension where the human beings will be living in bodies. And the elect will be living in immortal bodies, incorruptible bodies, glorified bodies, just like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the rest of the people who entered that kingdom of Christ Many of who are currently living on this earth, those who enter by the grace of God, since a judgment will be carried out according to St. Matthew chapter 25, where it is called the judgment upon the nations, where the King of kings and Lord of lords will determine which nations 
will not enter the millennial kingdom of Christ and which nations will enter the millennial kingdom of Christ and which people will not enter and which people will enter the millennial kingdom of Christ. Now we can see that there is a program already established by God before the foundation of the world, which has been taking place from stage to stage, from age to age, and from dispensation to dispensation, and we have reached the most glorious time in the divine program. We have reached the time where the divine program for the seventh dispensation, which is the dispensation of the kingdom, is opening and is overlapping with the dispensation of grace. And the divine program pertaining to the age of the cornerstone, where Christ calls us, saying, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. In other words, the things that will happen after the things that have already happened during the seven stages or ages of the gentle church. Now, a number of things happen which are already prophesied in the time of the age of the cornerstone. And those are the things that Christ, through his manifestation in Holy Spirit, through his angel messenger, will be making known to us at this end time. And that is why he tells us, come up hither. Why? Because here in the age of the cornerstone, Christ will be manifested in Holy Spirit through his angel messenger, speaking to us all these things which must shortly come to pass. He will be speaking to us with that great voice of trumpet, which is the great voice of trumpet of the gospel of the kingdom, and with that message of the gospel of the kingdom. He will be revealing to us all these things which must shortly come to pass. The message of the gospel of the kingdom, which is the great voice of trumpet, revolves around the second coming of Christ. In other words, around the coming of the Son of Man with his angels at this end time. And all the things that are prophesied in the scripture to happen at the last day also revolve around the second coming of Christ. Because all the things that will be happening on this earth at this end time in the seventh millennium and seventh dispensation, the dispensation of the kingdom, are revolving around the seventh seal at the last day. In other words, that is the center, the axis that all the things prophesied to take place at the last day or in the seventh millennium will revolve around. And that seventh seal, which is the coming of the Lord, which is revealed by Christ himself at the last day in the age of the cornerstone, in his manifestation through his angel messenger, through whom at the last day he would be making known his church, the mystery of the seventh seal. In other words, the mystery of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, the mystery that caused silence in heaven for about half an hour in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. That mystery, notice, is the mystery of the second coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, the coming of the Son of Man with the ministries of Moses and Elijah, which were manifested and were shown on Mount Transfiguration, where Christ showed the order of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels in the coming of the kingdom of God. Notice how the kingdom of God comes at the last day. It comes according to how it was shown in the vision on Mount Transfiguration. The coming of the Son of Man with his angels. Now, what was the coming of the Son of Man 2,000 years ago? Let's see what the coming of the Son of Man 2,000 years ago was, and then we will be able to see what the great mystery of the seventh seal and the battle of the seventh seal are. In other words, 
the stage that the second coming of Christ among the human race will go through. Just like in the first coming of Christ, there was a journey from the time Christ was in Mary's womb. Then he was born, then he grew, but as the years went by, things were happening in the life of Jesus. Being born in Bethlehem of Judea, according to the divine promise, we find that when he was about two years old, King Herod was already seeking him to destroy him. And now, what do you think of a man who's looking for a two-year-old child to kill him? Before God, he is nothing other than a direct descendant of Cain, who was the first murderer here on earth. And now, just the thought of killing the Messiah is enough to condemn King Herod and cast him into the lake of fire on Judgment Day. He is also guilty of the death of all those male children who were killed, who were two years old and under, when King Herod sent soldiers to kill all those children, thinking that if they killed all the boys two years old and under, he would kill the Messiah because the Messiah was supposed to be about two years old because the star of Bethlehem had started to shine two years before as the wise man told King Herod. Therefore, since the time that the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in heaven, the star of Bethlehem was seen, the Messiah had to be on earth. So if he killed all boys who were two years old and under, he would kill the Messiah. Even though they did not know who the Messiah was, they were looking for him. He, they were looking for him when he was only two years old. But notice, if the archangel Gabriel had not appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him, go to Egypt, Take the young child and his mother and go to Egypt, for King Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. He will look for him to kill him when he realized that the wise man had gone another way and had not returned to him to give him a report on the finding of the Messiah. The wise men were very obedient to God. They were wise in religious matters and also in matters of the universe. They were astrologers and they also knew astronomy because in those times astrology and astronomy were very close together and astronomers also knew about astrology and they also had religious knowledge because they understood that everything God does on earth is reflected in the sky. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Whenever God will do, is going to do, or is doing something here on earth, according to His program, signs appears in the sky that testify of what God is doing on earth. And in those days, God was fulfilling the first coming of the Messiah. He was fulfilling the birth of the Messiah. And the promise of the Messiah was already a reality among the Hebrew people. And the sign that the Messiah was on earth was the star of Bethlehem which was present for two years. And we don't know how much longer it remained after the wise men found the Messiah. Since they had the knowledge on those signs and the meaning of those signs in heaven, they could search on earth for what that sign in heaven was announcing. That is how it will be at the last day in which Christ prophesied 
In St. Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 to 31, saying the following, and I want to read these two verses of the scripture because we're living in times that are parallel to the time of the first coming of Christ and also to the time of the prophet Moses. And we're also living in days that are parallel to the days of Noah because Jesus said that the coming of the Son of Man would be as the days of whom? Of Noah and also as the days of Lot. So it is very important to know what happened in the divine program those days in order to see what will be happening at this end time. Now Christ said in St. Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 to 31, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, a sign promised to appear in heaven at the last day. That is the sign of the Son of Man announcing the coming of the Son of Man among the human race, announcing the second coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man with his angels to this earth at the last day. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, Jesus says. There Jesus is answering the questions that his disciples ask him in St. Matthew 24, verse 3, when he says, And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now notice, they ask him to make known to make known to them, they asked Jesus to make known to them what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world or end of the century. Christ said that there would be a sign, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That is the sign of his coming. On February 28, 1963, there was a sign in heaven, which I will show you in a little while. He goes on to say, And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. On February 28, 1963, a giant cloud appeared in the sky that was 30 miles wide at an altitude of 26 miles where clouds could not form. Why? Because there's no moisture at that height for clouds to be formed. This cloud appeared in the Arizona skies and science was perplexed about that cloud because they had no explanation for that cloud being formed at that height. Now, at that time, Reverend William Branham was hunting in the mountains of Tucson, Arizona, and he was able to explain what that cloud was. On page 546, Paragraph 275 and on of the book of the Revelation of the Seven Seals, preached by Reverend William Branham, he explains what the cloud was. He says, And did you notice that one angel I said in there was a strange angel? He looked more to me than any of the rest of them. You remember that? They were in a constellation, three on a side and one on top. And the one right next to me here, counting from the left, to the right would have been the seventh angel. He is referring to this angel because this cloud was not formed by moisture, but by angels of God, messengers of God, who are the seven messengers of the seven gentle church ages, and another angel who was different from the rest. 
that angel was different from the rest is this one that is flying here. If we turn the picture to the right, we will see that this is the angel that forms the white hair of the Lord because these angels in this cloud form the face of the Lord. It is not the literal face of the Lord, but the face of the Lord formed by a cloud. Just like you can form the face of a Lord using a pencil on, on a poster board and make a drawing there. And you have formed, you drew the face of the Lord. Here, it was made by angels in their theophanic bodies because here they are in their theophanic bodies. Here are the seven angel messengers of the seven gentle church ages. And here's the angel who was different from the rest which is the most important angel, the most notable angel out of those angels who appeared on that occasion. And the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says, and the one right next to me here, counting from the left to the right, would have been the seventh angel. He was brighter, meant more to me than the rest of them. You remember? I said he had his chest out like that and was flying eastward. You remember? Like that. I said it picked me up, lift me up. You remember that? Here it is, the one with the seventh seal. Which one of these angels is the one with the seventh seal? The angel who is different from the rest. The thing that I've wandered all my life. Amen. Them other seals meant a lot to me, of course, but oh, you don't know what this has meant. Now, which is the angel with the seventh seal? The angel who is different from the rest. And since that is the angel with the seventh seal, which is Christ, for the seventh seal to be fulfilled here on earth, for the coming of the Son of Man with his angels to be fulfilled, that angel must come to earth in human flesh. Just as the other angels of God came in human flesh, and they were the messengers of the seven stages of the gentle church. They were St. Paul, Irenaeus, Martin, Columba, Luther, Wesley, and Reverend William Branham. And now, each one of them had his ministry in the age in which God sent him. And through them, God called and gathered his elect of each age. He called and gathered his sheep into his fold as Christ had said in St. John chapter 10, verses 14 to 16, when Christ identified himself as the good shepherd and said, regarding his sheep and the work that he would carry out to gather his sheep, he said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. How are they going to hear the voice of Christ if he died, rose, and ascended to heaven, and sat at the right hand of God in heaven? Through Jesus Christ, in Holy Spirit, manifested in each angel messenger, speaking through each angel messenger, and calling and gathering his sheep through the ministry of Jesus Christ, in Holy Spirit, in each angel messenger. And that is how he calls and gathers his children, his sheep into God's fold, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the last day, he comes to the age of the cornerstone, which is the age of the golden age of the church of Jesus Christ. 
It is the golden age of the kingdom of God. It is a golden age for Christ to manifest himself and speak to his church with that great voice of trumpet and tell her, come up hither. Where? To the age of the cornerstone where he will also be manifested in human flesh like he was in each angel messenger of the seven gentle church ages. Christ and Holy Spirit will be manifested in human flesh at the last day in the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom and seventh millennium, speaking to us with that great voice of trumpet and making known to us all these things which must surely be done. In Revelation chapter 4, it says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And then, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 and on, Revelation 22, verse 6 and on, it says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done through its angel messenger. Notice, he reveals, he makes known to the church of Jesus Christ all these things which must shortly be done in the seventh millennium and in the age of the cornerstone and in the seventh dispensation, the dispensation of the kingdom. No one will be able to understand all these prophecies that point to the things that God will do at the end time except for the angel messenger of Jesus Christ through whom we get the divine revelation and the divine teaching of all those things which must shortly be done at this end time. Through that angel messenger Christ will be manifested in Holy Spirit making known to his church all these things which must shortly be done at this end time. There will be a spiritual struggle, a spiritual battle at this end time. And during the stage of the manifestation of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, through his angel messenger, we will be living in the most glorious stage of all stages. But there will be struggles. There will be certain difficulties as well. But the elect of God, the church of Jesus Christ, will always continue moving forward without being dismayed because she is led by Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, in his angel messenger who will be making known to her all these things which must shortly be done. And she will be obtaining all this knowledge. And the elect of God will be called and gathered together with that great sound of a trumpet that Jesus said. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect. Now notice that the angels come with the Son of Man, for Christ said, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Who sent him? Christ, the Son of Man. And now in St. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, it says that the Son of Man will come with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And now we can see that wherever Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is manifested, at the last day in Holy Spirit, the angels of the Son of Man, which are Moses and Elijah, will also be there. Those are the ministries of Moses and Elijah, which were shown there in Mount Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah, showing that in the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, coming in his kingdom, the ministries of Moses and Elijah would also be present. The ministry of Moses for the second time and the ministry of Elijah for the fifth time and also the ministry of Jesus for the second time. And where will those ministries be manifested here on earth? They will be wherever Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, the angel of the covenant is, wherever he is manifested in human flesh. That is where each one of those three great ministries 
promise for the last day will be. The ministry of Jesus for the second time. The ministry of Elijah for the fifth time. And the ministry of Moses for the second time. With those three great ministries manifested by Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit through his angel messenger, he will call and gather together all of God's elect. And he will prepare us by giving us the faith to be changed and raptured at this end time. By giving us the faith, the revelation of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels at this end time. Because everything revolves around the second coming of Christ, the coming of the angel of the covenant, the coming of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit at the last day manifested in human flesh according to his promise. And now, since God sent a forerunner for the first coming of Christ 2,000 years ago, and then the Messiah appeared, notice, it is here, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 and on, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. And who shall suddenly come to his temple? The Lord, whom ye seek. Who did the Hebrew people seek in the temple when they worshipped in the temple? They sought the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who would come? The Lord would come. The messenger or angel of the covenant whom the Hebrew people delighted in. The angel of the covenant who appeared to the prophet Moses and who sent the prophet Moses for the deliverance of the Hebrew people. The angel of the covenant who delivered the Hebrew people. The angel of the covenant who led the Hebrew people in that pillar of fire. The angel of the covenant who gave them the law on Mount Sinai. The angel of the covenant who accompanied Moses and used Moses all the days of his life. The angel of the covenant who parted the Red Sea through Moses. And the Hebrew people crossed over on dry land, and then he closed the Red Sea, and all the Egyptians drowned. All of Pharaoh's army drowned there in the Red Sea. Who performed all those miracles there? The angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, it was God who was manifested in Moses. That is why you find that Moses was the one who had to lift up his hands or lift up his rod and speak. And then the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, which is God himself in his Stephanic body, carried out all those things. In other words, the angel of the covenant told Moses what he was going to do and Moses announced it to the people and then God, the angel of the covenant, did everything. And now, this same angel of the covenant is the one who is promised to come in human flesh. But he says that first he sends the messenger, his messenger, who would be Elijah, who would prepare the way before him. And when he sent Elijah preparing the way before him, it was a man named John the Baptist. Jesus, in chapter 11 of St. Matthew, verse 14, says, referring to John the Baptist, he says, this is Elias, which was to come. Who was that? John the Baptist. When the archangel Gabriel announced the birth of John the Baptist, he announced to Zechariah as a priest that through his wife he would have a son who would be a prophet of God and who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah and who would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, meaning the hearts of the Hebrew people to the Christian faith. And when John the Baptist was born, 
They named him John. And if he was Elijah, the Elijah who had to come at that time, why didn't the archangel Gabriel tell him to name him Elijah? Because Elijah coming was the ministry of Elijah coming in another man. The ministry was called Elijah, but the man was named John. When God promises that once again he will send a man who came in the past and had a ministry, when he sends the fulfillment of that promise, it is another man with the ministry of that prophet who was here on earth in past times. That is why, notice, the ministry of Elijah the Tishbite came later in the prophet Elisha for the second time in a double portion. Then it came for the third time in John the Baptist, preparing the way of the Lord, preparing the way before whom? The angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, preparing the way before the word that was with God and was God who created all things and who would be made flesh and live among the Hebrew people in human flesh. When the Elijah came, who had to prepare the way of the Messiah in his first coming, to prepare the way of the angel of the covenant, who would come in the body of flesh, what happened? John the Baptist had that ministry. They ask him, who are you? Are you the Christ? He says, no. Are you that prophet? He says, no. Are you Elijah? He says, no. Now, why does he say no to everything? He was not the Messiah, and he was not the prophet that God spoke of through Moses, saying, The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet like me. Him shall you hear. That prophecy was to be fulfilled in the Messiah in his first coming, and in his second coming that promise will be fulfilled in all its fullness. And then he was not literally Elijah either because the Hebrew people were literally waiting for the prophet Elijah, nor was he the Elijah who had to come for running the second coming of Christ. That is why he said that he was not Elijah. He was not the literal prophet Elijah that they were waiting for. Rather, it was a man anointed with that ministering spirit of Elijah in whom that ministry was manifested for the third time. It had been in Elijah the Tishbite, in Elijah for the second time, and in John the Baptist for the third time. And now notice that every time that ministry comes, it comes with a new name and in a new veil of flesh. Therefore, the veil of flesh doesn't have to be called Elijah. He must have the name that his parents named him when they registered him and gave him that name. And now, in the time of the first coming of Christ, his forerunner would come, preparing the way before him, a prophet. And then the Messiah would be what? A prophet too. Because the coming of the Messiah is the coming of a prophet in whom the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, is manifested in human flesh. And now, that is the coming of the Word that was with God and is God. The Word made flesh. In St. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, referring to the Word coming according to the promise of the first coming of the Messiah, it says, and let's read this passage. Chapter 1, verse 14 of St. John says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What was the first coming of Christ? What was the coming of the Messiah? It was the coming of the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in a veil of flesh called Jesus. That was the first coming of Christ. God provided himself a veil of flesh called Jesus to offer the sin offering for the redemption of all the sons and daughters of God. The sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb 
was fulfilled in Jesus, as well as the sacrifice of the goat, which was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, on the tenth day of the seventh month of each year. And all the offerings or sacrifices that were carried out among the Hebrew people for sin and for the reconciliation and peace of the Hebrews with God were fulfilled in Jesus. And now, notice what the first coming of Christ was. It was the coming of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in human flesh. That is why the Hebrew people proclaim that the coming of the Messiah is the coming of God in a prophet. To the Hebrew people, the Messiah is a prophet who will come. And notice, he already came 2,000 years ago in human flesh. He was the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, the word made flesh among the Hebrew people in a young construction worker. Who would ever imagine that the first coming of the Messiah would be fulfilled in a construction worker? No one had imagined this, but God did have it in his mind, and it was a divine secret in the mind of God. Everyone knew that the Messiah would be a man who would be born on this earth and that he would be born of a virgin because Isaiah said in chapter 7, verse 14, Behold, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Immanuel. But no one knew that child would become a construction worker and that he would be raised After being born in Bethlehem of Judea, he would be raised where? In Nazareth. These are things God kept hidden. Although according to the scripture, he had to be a Nazarite, a Nazarene, to have his Nazarite bow and thus also fulfill the scripture. Now notice the mystery of the first coming of Christ among the Hebrew people was so great. Although it was prophesied that way, It was so great that not even the high priest, the most qualified among the Hebrew people in religious matters, could recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. And if he was able to realize that he was a prophet, he did not love him. Instead, he hated him. And when he told him, Are you the son of the living God? Jesus said to him, I have told you before, and you have not believed. And also he said to him, You have said it. And when he hears those beautiful words in which Jesus Christ identifies himself as the Son of God, the Messiah, instead of the high priest saying, Glory to God, the coming of the Messiah has been fulfilled. We have him here. He's one of us. As the prophet said, someone from among your brethren. Instead of saying that and glorifying God, he said, he has spoken blasphemy and he rent his clothes and he has the Sanhedrin council. He tells him, you have already heard him. What do you think? The high priest had already indicted him saying that he had spoken blasphemy, and now the sentence for blasphemers was death. And now he asked the Sanhedrin council, what do you think? The opinion of the high priest was that he was a blasphemer and that he was guilty of death. And the Sanhedrin council, most of them, because there were some like Joseph of Arimathea, like Nicodemus, and like Gamaliel, who did not consent to the death of Jesus. They did not give their vote. But those who voted in favor of the death of Christ were the majority, and therefore they pronounced the death sentence upon Jesus. All of them, or the majority, said, He is guilty of death. They sentenced him to death. But thank God for that, because if he had not died, redemption wouldn't have been carried out. 
The Hebrew people had to be blind to crucify their own Messiah, the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Melchizedek who appeared to Abraham, and to the Elohim who appeared to Abraham, who came in human flesh among the Hebrew people. They rejected him and asked for his death on Calvary's cross. Abraham did not do this. When Abraham saw him come in human form, he invited him to have dinner, to eat. He prepared him a calf tender. He accepted the invitation and ate with Abraham. He ate bread. He ate of the calf. He drank cow or sheep milk. And he spent some time with Abraham the day before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. His archangels, Gabriel and Michael, were also there as guests of Elohim in a visible form too, in the form of man eating with Abraham. All of this is a type and figure of what God will be doing at this end time when Elohim, Melchizedek, the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, will come back. The word will come in human flesh again at the last day. And that is the mystery of the seventh seal. That is the mystery of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels. That is the greatest mystery of all the mysteries in heaven and therefore on earth as well. That is the mystery that Christ said that not even the angels of heaven knew. That is the mystery that would be revealed to the church of Jesus Christ at the last day in the fulfillment of that mystery because the coming of Christ would be identified with the seventh seal and the fulfillment of that seventh seal. And just as it was in the first coming of Christ, the coming of the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, Melchizedek, Elohim, in human flesh, in a construction worker 2,000 years ago named Jesus, it was something so humble, so simple, that they stumbled over the veil of flesh. The second coming of Christ, that is the second coming of the angel of the covenant, of the angel of the Lord in human flesh, which will be as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as king of kings and lord of lords in his claiming work. Everything will be so simple that people, many of them will stumble over the bale of flesh in which the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, which is Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, will be manifested in human flesh at the last day. Through each angel messenger, he, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, had a partial manifestation, a temporary manifestation, and a manifestation in the portion pertaining to each age. In other words, in the portion promised for each age. And at the last day, Jesus Christ will have a manifestation in human flesh. Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit will also be manifested in human flesh at the last day in the age of the cornerstone as it was in past ages through the prophets of the Old Testament and through the apostles of Jesus Christ and through the seven angel messengers of Jesus Christ and as he was in the veil of flesh called Jesus. At the last day we find in Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 and on that the word comes back among the human beings. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There we find that there will be a battle, a struggle. First comes a spiritual battle. Then the beast, along with the kings who will give their power and strength to the beast, will rise against the second coming of Christ, according to the prophecies. Let's see where these prophecies are. 
chapter 17 of Revelation, verses 11 to 14 says, verses 11 to 14 says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. They are the members of the mystical body of Christ, who will rise in eternal bodies at the last day. And we who are alive, well, we will be changed. And thus, we will also be with this white horse rider of Revelation 19. This white horse rider of Revelation 19 is Christ in his second coming. Let's keep reading so that we have a clear picture. It says here, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written, that no man knew but he himself. In other words, he comes with a name that no man knows, with a new name in his second coming. That new name is the name that pertains to the second coming of Christ. For Christ says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, let's see, so that we can start getting a clear picture. Chapter 3, verse 12, Christ says here in Revelation, Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him, my new name. Christ has a new name. When our Lord Jesus Christ died, rose and ascended to heaven, he received a new name. Just like when the prophet Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream and was made second in line to the throne, second in command in Pharaoh's empire, then Joseph received a new name, according to Genesis chapter 41. And that new name he received there, notice it says, chapter 41, verse 45 and on of Genesis says, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Sephneth Peniah, and he gave him to wife Aseneth, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Egypt. Now we can see, notice, he was about 30 years old. He was 30 years old. He was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. He was 30 years old when he was made second in command in Pharaoh's kingdom. And also, when he received that new name and that new position as second in command in Pharaoh's empire, to the point that his brothers did not recognize him when they saw him, when they went to buy food in Egypt. He was dressed in Gentile clothing. He was styled as a Gentile. And notice, he was wearing gentle clothes. And he was the one in charge of the food to preserve people's lives. And now, all of this speaks of Christ. And it speaks of the time when Christ will reveal himself to the Hebrew people. 
se darán cuenta que es when they will not realize that he is the same one who was there 2,000 years ago in human flesh in that veil of flesh called Jesus. They will not realize that he is the same angel of the covenant who was veiled in human flesh in that young construction worker named Jesus. Now at the end time, he will come again. The angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, will come veiled in human flesh again. Notice here, it says, And he was clothed with a bester, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He has a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And now, verse 14, I was quoting you, St. John chapter 1, verse 1 and on, and now in verse 14 of St. John chapter 1, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to different prophets of the Old Testament, and who appeared to Moses, and who used Moses for the deliverance of the Hebrew people. Now we find that he came cloth in human flesh. He came cloth as a human. The angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, who is a man of the sixth dimension, now put on human clothing, a human body, and came among the Hebrew people to carry out the work of redemption on Calvary's cross with that human body. And now, at the last day, the word coming again is promised in the scripture. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his bester and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, because the King of kings and Lord of lords is the one who comes at the last day. It is the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, coming at the last day in Holy Spirit and taking up a veil of flesh among the human race, and through that veil of flesh, manifesting himself in the fulfillment of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels. And now, since God sent a forerunner at this end time, the forerunner of the second coming of Christ, just like in the first coming of Christ, he sent a forerunner who was John the Baptist. Now at this end time, he sent the forerunner of the second coming of Christ with the spirit and power of Elijah, which was the Reverend William Branham. He came with the spirit and power of Elijah in the fourth manifestation of the ministry of Elijah among the human race. And now let's see what the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says will be happening at this end time. On pages 154 and on of the book of the Revelation of the Seven Seals, he says, paragraph 302, Glory, notice, and when this Holy Spirit that we have becomes incarnate to us, the one that's in our midst now in the form of the Holy Ghost becomes incarnate to us in the person of Jesus Christ, will crown him king of kings. Now, notice, let's see what the incarnation or coming of the Holy Spirit incarnate at the last day will be. On page 318, paragraph 391 of the book of the Revelation of the Seven Seals, Reverend William Branham says, while he is praying, 
May the Holy Spirit come down now, the white horse rider, while his spirit, spirit of Christ, in the face of Antichrist, and call his own. How will the white horse rider of Revelation 19 come? Who is the white horse rider of Revelation 19 whose name is called the Word of God? He is Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. For the Word is the Holy Spirit. He is the angel of the covenant. He is God in and with his theophanic body. But he will come at this in time according to Revelation chapter 19 and according to Revelation chapter 10 and according to St. Matthew chapter 24 verses 30 to 31. And now, how will his coming be? The forerunner of the second coming of Christ says on page 295, paragraph 196 of the Revelation of the Seven Seals, making reference to the white horse rider of Revelation 19, he says, But when our Lord appears here on earth, he'll be riding on a snow white horse, and he'll be completely, fully the Immanuel, the Word of God, Incarnate in a man. What will the coming of the white horse rider of Revelation 19, the coming of the word coming at the last day? It will be the coming of the word coming in human flesh at the last day. If we find the veil of flesh, where there will be the fulfillment of the coming of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit at the last day. Well, we would be finding the coming of the white horse rider of Revelation 19 in human flesh. That is how we will be finding the coming of the Son of Man with his angels at the last day because the ministries of Moses for the second time, Elijah for the fifth time, and Jesus for the second time will be there. And that is how Christ will fulfill his coming in Holy Spirit by taking up a veil of flesh of the end time, of this end time through whom he will be manifested at the last day in the age of the cornerstone, in the midst of his gentle church, giving us his message of the great voice of trumpet, or last trumpet, or trumpet of God. And thus he will be speaking to us and revealing to us all these things which must shortly come to pass. That veil of flesh will be called, or is called in the scripture, the angel of Jesus Christ. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. And right there, notice, it goes on to say, I am the root of the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star, and the spirit and bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now we can see here that Jesus Christ sends his angel messenger, and through his angel messenger, Jesus Christ reveals himself, manifests himself, and operates, manifests, all these attributes in him. And through him, he manifests himself as the root and the offspring of David and as the bright and morning star. And he speaks to us all these things which must shortly come to pass. And that is how we will be hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit at the last day. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. In other words, the Holy Spirit through his manifestation in human flesh and his angel messenger will be speaking all these things which must shortly come to pass. And the bride, which is the church of Jesus Christ, will be saying the same thing because she will have Christ manifested in her midst in human flesh in his angel messenger. And she will be hearing the voice of Christ and then she will be making known to humanity what Christ has said at this end time. And that is how the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, of the glory of Jesus Christ in his coming at this end time. Now,
the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom there will be this manifestation of Christ in Holy Spirit manifesting the ministries of Moses, Jesus and Elijah that angel is not Moses that angel is not Elijah either and that angel is not Jesus either he is a man of this end time, a human being of this end time, redeemed by the blood of Christ and filled with the Spirit of Christ. He is a member of the mystical body of Christ, a man born into the mystical body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, born again, in whom Jesus Christ will be manifested in Holy Spirit, fulfilling all these promises in whom Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, which is Jesus Christ, will be. In the Old Testament, he is called the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, and in the new covenant, he is Jesus Christ. And after he ascended to heaven, notice, he appeared to Saul of Tarsus in the pillar of fire. He tells Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And Saul, knowing that this was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had spoken to Moses, he tells him, Lord, that is, Elohim, who are you? And now, the one who is speaking from that light, brighter than the sun, tells him, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Notice, Jesus Christ is the pillar of fire, the angel of the covenant. It is Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, who at the last day will come in human flesh in his angel messenger, which is the last prophet, the prophet of the dispensation of the kingdom, of the seventh dispensation, who comes with the message of the gospel of the kingdom and who is also the angel messenger of the age of the cornerstone. That is the instrument of Christ, in whom Christ, the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, the word incarnate, will be at the last day. That is where the angel, who was different from the rest, will be manifested in human flesh who appeared in this cloud formed by angels on February 28, 1963 and with the manifestation of Christ and Holy Spirit in his angel messenger, the white hair of the Lord, which is a type and figure that will be fulfilled at the last day with the coming of that angel who was different from the rest manifested in human flesh. We will have Jesus Christ as judge of all the earth and as king of kings and lord of lords in his claiming work. On this occasion, we have seen this mystery, the mystery of the battle of the seventh seal under the great mystery of the seventh seal. The great mystery of the second coming of Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as King of kings and Lord of lords in his claiming work. But remember, the instrument, the veil of flesh, the angel of Jesus Christ is not Jesus Christ, nor Moses, nor Elijah. He is a man redeemed by the blood of Christ, a son of God, of the mystical body of Christ, who will be here on the last day in the seventh millennium, and he will be in the church of Jesus Christ, in the age of the cornerstone, as the angel messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ, and through that man, that messenger, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord will be manifested, operating the ministries of Moses for the second time, Elijah for the fifth time, and Jesus for the second time. That is the coming of the white horse rider of Revelation 19, the coming of the Word in human flesh at the last day. And now, we have seen that this is to be fulfilled in the church of Jesus Christ at the last day, 
in the age of the cornerstone. And now, the question that many have is, and in which territory will that promise be fulfilled? The coming of the Son of Man with His angels coming in human flesh at the last day? The forerunner of the second coming of Christ spoke to us about that rider and where that rider would come from. Now we find that through the ages, Christ has been coming from age to age, manifested in human flesh, in each angel messenger. And where has he been? In the territory to which he sent each one of those messengers and in the age where his work pertaining to the ministry that he operated in each angel messenger was fulfilled and he called and gathered his elect in each one of those ages in the territory pertaining to each age and from there the message spread to other nations and now notice the first coming of Christ was in the land of Israel. Christ said, as the lightning comes out of the east, in other words, the land of Israel, and shines even unto the west. The west is the continent of the Americas. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Such will be the day in which the Son of Man will manifest Himself, reveal Himself. In other words, He will reveal Himself, He will manifest Himself like the lightning, shining where? In the West. In the West is where the coming of the Son of Man with His angels shines. The coming of the White Horse Rider of Revelation 19. In the West, the continent of the Americas, is where the white horse rider of Revelation 19 comes manifested in human flesh at this end time. In the West is where the Word, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate in man, comes. The continent of the Americas consists of North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And the part that pertains to North America was already fulfilled in the seventh age of the gentle church, where he sent the forerunner of the second coming of Christ, Reverend William Branham. And the seventh gentle church age was fulfilled. And now, all that's left of the continent of the Americas, of the Western continent, is Latin America and the Caribbean for the fulfillment of the coming of the White Horse Rider of Revelation 19, which is the coming of the Word incarnate in a man. It is the coming of the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant, coming in human flesh at the last day, clothing himself in human flesh, clothing himself in a veil of flesh in the midst of the Church of Jesus Christ, at the last day. And now notice, all we have left is the Latin American and Caribbean territory for the fulfillment of the age of the cornerstone and the fulfillment of the things he has said that he will do at the last day. And that is why in the age of the cornerstone he comes manifested in his angel messenger, making known to us all these things which must shortly come to pass at this end time. And where is he coming? In the West, in Latin America and the Caribbean, making known to us all these things which must shortly come to pass. And now, notice what the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says in the message, God's only provided place of worship, page one and on. And now, in our book, of quotes, which contains excerpts of different messages of Reverend William Branham. We also find this excerpt from page 1, paragraph 6, which says, Now, there's, I was getting pretty old, and I thought, Will I, will there be another revival? I'll see another time. And just remember, from the West, will come a white horse rider 
We will ride this trail again. That's right. Soon as we get ready, it's a promise. You see? If it is a promise, it has to be in the Bible. And that promise is in Revelation 19, which is the white horse rider of Revelation 19, which is the word coming at the last day. It is the coming of the word. It is the coming of the angel of the Lord, the angel of the covenant. It is the coming of Jesus Christ, in Holy Spirit in human flesh, in his angel messenger at this end time, in the angel messenger of the age of the cornerstone. And if we find that angel messenger in him, we will be finding the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit manifested. And we will be finding the ministries of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus there being manifested, being operated by the Holy Spirit through his angel messenger. Now we have seen the mystery, the great mystery of the seventh seal. And we have also seen the battle of the seventh seal that it will have to go through. The second coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, the angel of the covenant manifested in his angel messenger will have to go through a battle. Now we can see that even though there will be a battle, that the seventh seal, in other words, the second coming of Christ will go through, the promise is, the prophecy says, regarding the ten kings and the beast, it says, let's read here, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. I'm reading Revelation 17, verses 11 and on. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Here we have the prophecy of that showdown between Christ and the Antichrist because the beast will persecute. He will combat the second coming of Christ, the beast and those ten kings. But notice, we find that this fight, this battle, notice, will be the devil who will be manifested in the Antichrist, in the beast, and he will combat the coming of Christ, the angel of the covenant, coming in human flesh, in his angel messenger. And along with his angel messenger will come once the trumpet has sounded, at the end, the dead in Christ will come and they will be with him. And we who are alive will be changed and we will also be with him. And we will be with Christ manifested in his angel messenger. And after being here on earth for 30 to 40 days in the new body, then we will go with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will see Jesus Christ in his glorified body. But before that, we will only be seeing him manifested in Holy Spirit through his angel messenger. That is the mystery of the seventh seal. That is the great mystery of the seventh seal being revealed to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is also the mystery related to the battle of the seventh seal, which the seventh seal, in other words, the coming of the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord in human flesh at the last day, will have to go through. It has been a great privilege to be with you, testifying to you about this great mystery of the seventh seal in which the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says that 
that white horse rider will come where and from where? From the West. In other words, from the continent of the Americas. The veil of flesh will be a man from the West. That will be the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be in the midst of the church of Jesus Christ, who will be a man redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who will have been born in the kingdom of God, in the church of Jesus Christ, by believing in Christ as his Savior and washing away his sins in the blood of Christ and receiving his Holy Spirit. That is the angel who comes with the seal of the living God at the last day. That is the angel who at the last day has the seal of the living God, the Holy Spirit manifested in him in human flesh according to the divine promise. That is also the messenger to the Hebrew people. But first he comes in the midst of the church of Jesus Christ to call and gather God's elect with the message of the great voice of trumpet and thus to prepare all of God's elect to be changed and raptured at this end time. The great mystery of the seventh seal. Did you see how simple this mystery is? The forerunner of the second coming of Christ rightly stated that if we did not watch the seventh seal, in other words, the coming of the Lord would go over our heads because it will all be so simple that the seventh seal would be fulfilled, manifested in simplicity. And that if we did not watch, we would miss it. Jesus Christ himself said to watch. To watch for what? For his coming. Because notice, it would be something so simple that mankind would not even realize the fulfillment of the coming of the Lord at the last day, the coming of the angel of the covenant coming in human flesh, in a veil of flesh, of the last day, manifesting his attributes at this end time, the attributes promised to be manifested in the second coming of Christ with his angels at the last day. But the angel is not the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Apostle wanted to worship him on two occasions. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 10, and Revelation chapter 22, verses 6 to 9, but the angel told him, See that thou do it not, for I am your fellow servant. Let's see, so that you have it clear. It says, Revelation 22, verse 7 and on, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. This angel is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the prophet of the dispensation of the kingdom and of the age of the cornerstone. That is why he did not accept the worship of John the Apostle. Because a man cannot be worshipped. God is spirit. And the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. And now we can see that this angel messenger is not Jesus Christ. Rather, he is a prophet of Jesus Christ sent to his church and then he will be sent to the Hebrew people. This angel messenger is the prophet messenger of the age of the cornerstone for the church of Jesus Christ, and he is the prophet of the dispensation of the kingdom, 
with the message of the gospel of the kingdom, which is the message of the great voice of trumpet, which revolves around the second coming of Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It is the first time that Jesus Christ sends a dispensational prophet to his church. Previously, he had sent messengers of ages to his church, but neither St. Paul, nor Irenaeus, nor Martin, nor Columba, nor Luther, nor Wesley, nor William Branham, none of these were a dispensational prophet, although some of them were prophets, but not dispensational prophets. It is the first time that God sends a dispensational prophet to his church, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sends him with a dispensational message because God cannot send a dispensational prophet without a message. God always sends his prophets with a message from heaven. And now, we can see that in that prophet comes that angel of the covenant, which is the word, which is the Holy Spirit manifested in human flesh as he was manifested in the prophets of the Old Testament, as he was manifested in the apostles, as he was manifested in the seven angel messengers, and as he was manifested in our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how the great mystery of the seventh seal and the battle of the seventh seal opens for all of God's elect. This great mystery opens so that we may welcome the seventh seal, the angel who was different from the rest, coming in human flesh, in the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through that angel manifesting, operating the ministries of Moses for the second time, Elijah for the fifth time, and Jesus for the second time. And where are the people who will be seeing this great event, this great mystery being opened, being fulfilled, and who would be receiving it in his coming? Well, here we are in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the territory where the wide horse rider of Revelation 19 would come, which would be the coming of the angel of the Lord, of the angel of the covenant, of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, of the Word, of the Word incarnate in the man of this end time from the West. Here we are, thanking God for the great blessing we have been given and the great privilege we have been given to live in the territory where this great mystery would be fulfilled, would be opened, and would be made known to all of God's sons and daughters. Here we are, seeing the great mystery of the seventh seal being revealed in the West, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we thank our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. May the blessings of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, be upon each one of you and also upon me. And soon, may the very last elect of God be gathered. And soon, may all the dead in Christ rise and may we who are alive be changed. And then may we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, in the house, and to the house of our Heavenly Father. And may we be there with Christ for those three and a half years of the marriage supper of the Lamb while the earth goes through the judgments of the great tribulation and then may we come back to the earth for the glorious millennial kingdom of Christ with his church and with the human beings who will be living at that time of the great millennial kingdom in the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your kind attention, beloved friends and brethren, present and radio listeners. 
It has been a great privilege to testify to you about this great mystery, the great mystery of the seven seal and the battle of the seven seal. May God bless you and keep you and continue having a day filled with the blessings of Christ. And I leave with us now Reverend Miguel Bermudez Marín.